that they could have made their defensive line, which is so good that year, even better and really look good in the long term. Hey everybody, Trevor Sikkim here with another episode of Bust or Broken. We're not doing QB this time. I know we've done QB for a couple of them and that always you know, gets people excited. But this one, I promise you, is going to be just as exciting because the topic today is Leonard Fournette. Fournette was an incredibly highly touted recruit coming through, going to LSU, almost had a 2,000 yard season when he was at LSU, gets drafted top five to the Jacksonville Jaguars and now he's already on his second team. Granted, he won a Super Bowl, so I guess he's kind of happy with that, but we got to figure out what happened. How did he not pan out with the team that picked him so high in the 2017 NFL Draft? And to help us, we have Zach Goodall, who covered Fournette's time in Jacksonville with Big Cat Country, Lockdown NFL Jags. I mean, now he's covering the Florida Gators and Tampa Buccaneers. I mean, like, Zach, you're just you're just like an all-Florida reporter at this point. Like, I, I'm expecting you to cover the Miami Heat next or something because it just feels like you're destined to cover all of the teams that are in the Florida area. Yeah, I'm, my goal at least is to cover every big football team, college and pro. Uh, I think pro is a little more realistic. I've always been a pro guy, but we've got a good start on college so far. Well, I really appreciate you joining me. I know you're going to bring great insight into this topic. You were the first guy I had to call about it because this is, it's it, Fournette's journey is wild. It just seemed like it happened so fast. He rose the ranks. He become he became the number one overall recruit in the country, I believe, in the 2014 recruiting class. And then it was like, okay, first year at LSU, 1,000 yards. Second year at LSU, almost 2,000 yards. Third year, he was injured, so it wasn't as great. But then he gets drafted number four overall by the Jacksonville Jaguars. I want you to take me back to draft night. How did you feel about the pick when it happened? And I know you're, you're a draft guy as well, so I wonder what you thought about Leonard Fournette even before he was a Jacksonville Jaguar. Well, you know, I'm like the rest of draft Twitter, I guess, in a sense. I don't love the idea of drafting a running back in the top five picks, and that's what happened. He went number four overall. He came in. I forget what he weighed in at the combine. It was something huge that he ended he, up he shedding like, pretty he quickly. Like two, he was like 240 or something crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he ran a 4.5 one. So nice. he had all that hype, especially after the injury. Everyone thought he was going to come in and be this great bell cow back. And, and he looked the type of a bell cow back from the 2000s or the 1990s, right? right Not exactly right. the modern era one, like the Christian McCaffrey's that were, you know, he was selected four picks later. Um, but Jacksonville, they had selected Blake Bortles. They saw some good from him. Uh, 2015, especially that 35 touchdown season. Mm -hmm. They did not want to give up on him even after a down year in 2016. And they looked at Leonard Fournette as this surefire running back prospect. You bring him in and you can take stress off of Bortles in the passing game. And they bought in on that. They loved that idea. They passed up on a couple of good quarterbacks to do so. And it really worked year one. I mean, they went from what, five and 11, six and 10 to the AFC championship right off the bat. Everything was good. Fournette was productive as a rookie, even though he only averaged 3.9 yards per carry. Mm -hmm. and, and people thought that Bortles was fixed. He, he surely wasn't a great quarterback, but he was a lot more effective that year. The team bought in, they extended Blake Bortles and... <laughs> Here we are. I mean, yeah. Trevor Lawrence a couple years later. So it, it, at the time, I wasn't really for it because I didn't love the idea of selecting a running back that high or at least that running back. Right. But I understood what their process was. It worked for a year. And then again, yeah, here we are. Was there a prospect in 2017 that you were that you were on a lot more than Leonard Fournette that you were saying like, OK, like I, I know the Jaguars are probably going to pick him because of you know, in theory, the reasons you highlighted make sense. A great running game is a, is a young quarterback's best friend. If he can make sure that he leans on the run game, it can give him extra confidence. Like, I see where the Jaguars were going with it, and, and you obviously outlined that as well. Was there somebody else that you were hoping that they could get their hands on with that early pick? There were a couple. Um, even though Blake, you figured he was coming back. They picked up his fifth year option. Mm -hmm. I was at the point, I, it was kind of an early trend before these teams started moving on from their quarterbacks within two or three years. I said, go and upgrade, go and do what you can. That was the year of Deshaun Watson. I know that no one could have predicted what Patrick Mahomes was going to do with the chiefs, right. but I was a fan of him coming out of college. You know, I thought, he, I think he was my quarterback number two and you know, Jacksonville probably was not the place for him because he needed somewhere he could develop like he did in Kansas City with Alex Smith. 
It just wasn't the ideal spot. But the bottom line is there were quarterbacks they could have upgraded with. Another one being a Christian McCaffrey, if you do go running back. And mm-hmm. also, I like Jonathan Allen. I thought that they could have made their defensive line, which is so good that year, even better and really look good in the long term. Because uh, Malik, da- uh, Malik Jackson, Calais Campbell, they were older veterans. They weren't people that were going to be around for the long term. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you double dip, you go and get that defensive lineman that you can build the future and also get some sort of impact from. I thought it could have made, you know, somewhat of a impact comparable to a running back at that point. All right. So you, you, you touched on a little bit, but let's dive into that first year. You talked about some of the statistical success he had, but that was also a fantastic year for the Jaguars. I don't want you to tell me hindsight because hindsight we know now is a little bit fool's gold because well, not necessarily the team. I feel like the team probably would have been well if they could have stayed together as much as possible, but when that 2017 year happened, and that was the year that the Jaguars almost went to the Super Bowl, some would tell you that they should have gone to the Super Bowl and that Miles Jack was not down. But during that season, did you have any sort of switching of opinion? Did you go like, okay, I'm in on Fournette now? Was that almost like the peak of what was the Fournette roller coaster? I think so. Because in addition to being a Jags writer and podcaster, I was also a fan. Sure. <laughs> I try, I try not to let that influence me in the stuff I do now, but I'm definitely a Jags fan at heart and seeing Leonard Fournette come in, the offense was moving, especially when they hit that stride later in the year against Houston, Seattle. There are a couple games where they were really firing on all cylinders. I, I did buy in on it. Blake looked like the dude in 20, uh, 2015, a lot more efficient. He can make some impressive deep throws, maybe not taking as many risks, but it was working out. So at that point, you know, it seemed like it was going to work. I was really curious about how they would go about it the next off season, how they build upon such a good running game. I thought Fournette could have used a lot better help in run blocking. Uh, they still have really not done that much to that offensive line compared to when he was there in 2017, 2018. And we see it's still not a really great unit. It's okay. It pass protects pretty well, but it never really did enough for Fournette, especially as you know, an in-between the tackles rusher, to generate a power looking offense for him. They've done a better job with James Robinson. He's a lot more patient, more elusive, and he still brings some power to the table. So we've seen an improvement in their run game, but it just didn't seem like they really did a ton for Fournette, which hurt him in the long run. Now, I think, yeah, that that's really where we start to get into, okay, the bust or broken part of the conversation. Was it Fournette or was it the team? Because you talked about it there. He wasn't really the in-between the tackles runner that you wanted. And as you mentioned, when we discussed the pre-draft, that's what the guy looks like. You know, he's six foot, six foot one, 240 pounds, runs a four, four. Like he's supposed to be the bulldozer. So was the reason why he wasn't a between the tackles runner. Was that a four net thing? Because that lends itself to him being more of a bust given to what his traits were, or was it more, was the Jags offense not really good? Was he getting, or the offensive line not really good? Like, was he getting scared? Was he, was he bouncing things to the outside because the line wasn't good or was he just not seeing the line correctly? I think it's a mix of those two things. Uh, I think a third is that teams realized, okay, they're just going to try and run the ball and run crossing routes on us with Blake Bortles. Like Mm -hmm. let's dare him to try and throw the ball on us. And at that point, you know, they start filling the box and Fournette does not have, good vision. I I was going to say great vision. He doesn't have good vision um, when he's in the backfield and trying to make a decisive move. uh, What if a gap opens up to try and burst through it or when he's trying to break outside, you know, we see him hit a pretty nice top speed at times, but he doesn't exactly have that change of direction speed either. So you have to look at his skill set and pair it with that offensive line. And it just really, it seemed like a match the first year and it never truly Mm. remained to be that match. You add in Blake and his inefficiencies and yeah, pretty easy to figure out. Yeah. I know that second year he had the hamstring injuries and then he Mm. had the the fight with Shaq Lawson, which was hilarious. And then that third year that he was with Jacksonville, it was kind of, it was wild because you look at his stats, you go, okay, he was, he was a thousand yard rusher. He also led the team in receptions with 76. He had, he was third on the team in targets with a hundred. And so you go like, whoa, whoa, okay. So this guy's doing stuff in the passing game. He's got over a thousand yards on the ground. What happened? Were those stats that season just a lie? As we often know that numbers can sometimes tell us. 
a, a mix. There's still that talent there that we saw in 2017, but we think I would say he had hit his ceiling and they really used him as a high volume guy at that point. I mean, what, what were they doing with that offense in 2018 right. um, or 2019? I should say right. um, as they were going through their quarterback change with Nick Foles and Gardner Minshew and that entire mess. Uh, I, I think they looked at him as kind of a security valve and that really increased his value in terms of production but it was the same type of thing. He really wasn't doing anything that special or something that could elevate the offense. And by that point, you, you mentioned the Shaq Lawson fight. There's that. There was um, his incidences with uh, Tom Coughlin, butting heads with uh, the coaching staff like that and being sure. late to team meetings. Yeah. Uh, there's the off field. He was arrested for an unpaid speeding ticket and it was treated like the OJ Howard chase uh, in Jacksonville. <laughs> there was couple of squad cars i remember a huge overreaction a news chopper on it and at that point it was starting to get the feeling of okay this is probably coming to an end at this point were and you in the news chopper were you were you up there <laughs> send, were, you, were you up there sending the tweets from the chopper i wish man that would that would have been pretty fun uh, i can't imagine anything more thrilling than an unpaid speeding ticket <laughs> <laughs> so, covering right. that man <laughs> to, to wrap it all up a little bit here it sounds like we're leaning a little bit more towards bust because, it, it, you know, the quarterback situation didn't help. And I always want to be as fair to the players as possible. It sounds like the quarterback situation, both when Blake was there and when they were revolving quarterbacks with Foles and Minshew, that all didn't really help. We know the dysfunction that was around some of the decision making in the organization that, that shipped off a lot of their great defensive players too. So all of that context to say though, even when Fournette was on the field, even when he was racking up some of the common stats that we see, is it fair to say he just was not able to live up to number four overall? Like he just shouldn't have been picked that high? Definitely. And I think that goes back to the same argument with running backs in the top five. I think selecting a guy that was limited, not a great pass protector, not great vision, a solid you know, volume receiver, but not exactly a great route runner or a threatening receiver at the same time. I think his value was really overinflated and being selected at the number four pick, he was always going to be a bust. He mm -hmm. was, unless you're Saquon Barkley and even that, like you've got to be special. You got to stay healthy. You got to go the whole nine yards. Yeah. I don't see the value. I think he was always going to be a bust in the team only further broken if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. So it looks like we are officially labeling the Jacksonville Jaguars part of Leonard Fournette's career as a bust, but that's okay because as Zach now knows, covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneer, you, you can you can refer to him as uh, playoff Lenny and even Lombardi Lenny now. So it had, right. a, uh, it, it, it had a happy ending here at the end, still in the state of Florida even. Zach, really appreciate all the insight, man. That was fantastic. Thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. We will be back next week with a brand new episode of Bust or Broken. I already know what the topic is, and I'm telling you, kind of the same thing. You are not going to want to miss it. We'll see you guys then.